So good afternoon, everyone, and very welcome to uh, PhD Defense of Carlos de Souza. For those of you who are not today morning, Carlos has been doing his PhD here in our department under the supervision of Professor Erin Bashevsky Puli and uh, Professor Jengao. Uh, he submitted his thesis, the faculty approved the thesis, sent to the committee, and the PhD committee appointed our uh, Professor Kim Goran Nielsen from University of Bergen and Professor Mauricio Kolo from University of Scarlet. Uh, Professor Kolo, do you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you well. Yes, perfect, perfect. And myself, uh, Amir Nejad from the Marine Department. So, Carlos today morning had a trial lecture, and I'm happy to congratulate you. The trial lecture was approved. So, 50% congratulations. I keep the 50% after this presentation. <laughs> At least I have 50%. Yes, 50%. Is okay. <laughs> so, Carlos now will present his uh, PhD thesis in 45 minutes. Uh, after the presentation, we will take 10 minutes break, and then we will start the discussion with the committee, the audience, uh, also the audience online. Uh, can ask question, but please inform me in that 10 minutes. So anyone has a question from the audience, please let me know in that 10 minutes. So Carlos, floors is yours. Thank you. And thank you for everyone here who's here. So the, the title of my thesis is Structural Modeling, Couple Dynamics and Design of Large Photoing Turbines. Doesn't go. Uh, it doesn't progress. I mean, I can see the pointer, but uh, it's not progressing. Yeah, but he did. He, he cheated. <laughs> yeah, but then I would like to use this for pointing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I will start with the introduction motivation, scope, contributions. And then I'll talk a bit about the theoretical development. So modeling crystals, floating to buy, float to wind turbine dynamic and control, and time domain analysis. Yeah. And then I will present the publications and uh, discuss the results and provide some final considerations. Um, okay, so float to wind turbines is a very quickly progressing industry. And it's progressing towards the economy of scale. In the sense that people believe that by building more uh, win, uh, larger wind turbines with more power per unit, you're going to get uh, quicker to cost effectiveness. Uh, but it's also a very multi cross disciplinary field of engineering. It mixes structural mechanics, aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, and control systems. And I like to think of this as actually a new field of engineering with its own dynamics, uh, specific modeling approach, and analysis techniques and a couple of new design paradigms. Yeah. Okay. So in this thesis, I explore research gaps from different topics. Um, but specifically, I looked into a couple of dynamics of wind, the platform and rotor and controller. Specifically, uh, there were some reported changes in surging pitch nitro period under operational conditions that I looked into. And for the control system, I Look more into motion compensation strategies and how the controller affects structural integrity. And I also looked a bit into hydrostructural modeling, so modeling approaches and how to distribute the loads over the platform. You ask me? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what I find that were the most important contributions here were a better understanding of the couple dynamics. So an explanation for this change in surging pitch periods. And the notion that um, aerodynamic damping and inertia effects are frequency dependent. Um, yeah, I also investigated how to use a, a practical motion compensation strategy for the controller and how to tune the controller, including this motion compensation strategy. Uh, so, approach to model the platform's flexible structure and how to distribute the loads and the consequence of having a flexible who in the global platform dynamics. And then I used what I learned in uh, design of large twin, uh, large pole twin turbines, which uh, I call large, who is bigger than 10 megawatts. 
Um, so basically, we'll just discuss some modeling approaches that are specific for this next class of flow twin turbines. Uh, one of the conclusions that using a detuning controller is inadequate even in very low uh, stage of the design. Yeah. Okay, so we're starting with the modeling principles. So modeling is always a compromise between accuracy and computational efficiency. So how many degrees of freedom are going to include? How complex uh, and accurate is load model to be? And which couplings you're going to model? Uh, I like to think the wind turbine as four main components. So the platform, the floating platform, the tower, the rotor nacelle assembly, and the marine system. Um, we normally talk about aero hydro servo elastic model for floating wind turbines which just means the integrated uh, system with all the subsystems affecting the dynamics. So for aerodynamics, what matters here is the interaction between the incoming wind and the rotor, which we're going to provide us the aerodynamic torque around the shaft and the thrust. Um, one method to calculate these loads uh, in time domain is the blade element and momentum method. Uh, also, the tower influencing the wind flow is important. It's normally uh, calculated with uh, potential theory. And the drag at the tower and ceiling platform is also relevant. So when it comes to hydrodynamics, we talk about hydrostatic restoring and uh, wave structure interaction, where potential theory is, in most cases, the most adequate uh, approach here, because we are talking about large bodies. But also, viscous loads can play a significant role. For the controller, um, for the purpose of this thesis, I specifically will speak about the blade pitch controller, which is basically the system that makes the blades to rotate around the road shaft, and also the generator torque controller, which governs how much torque the generator applies in the wind turbine. And finally, for structure modeling, we normally have a good model for the rigid body dynamics, but also it can be interesting to model parts of the structure as flexible to get the sectional loads. Uh, when this is the case, uh, we want to make sure that the interaction between the hydrodynamic loads and the structural deformations is well taken care of. And for that, we need to distribute the loads over the whole. So Morrison's equation is a good approach for that for some case. But a more sophisticated and accurate way is to combine potential theory with quadratic drag. Okay, now dynamics and control. So the primary goal of the control system for the photo wind turbine or for a wind turbine is to maximize power extraction and at the same time reduce the loads on the structure. Uh, it's, it's done by adapting the operation to the incoming wind it's in this direction. So the most popular approach for wind turbine control for the modern wind turbine is a variable speed variable pitch strategy. It just means that both the generator torque and the blade pitch angle are controlled according to the operational region. So as an example, I put here the diagram for the NREL 5 megawatt wind turbine. So when we are below Kutin, we have no torque being applied by generator and the blades will be in most cases at zero degrees. Then as the wind speed starts to grow and it's bigger than three meters per second, the torque applied by generator starts to be driven by a law, by a quadratic law with the water speed, with the objective of optimizing the extracted power. Uh, the blade pitch angle could be at zero or could be set to an optimal angle according to the incident wind speed. Above rated, uh, the generator torque could be either uh, set as constant or vary in order to make the power constant. But now the blade pitch angle starts to, to be controlled with feedback of the rotor speed error. Uh, so basically, uh, it's common to use a proportional integral controller with feedback of the gener generator uh, rotor speed error, which is basically like this. You have like the error multiplied by a constant gain and also integrated. By this, you're going to pitch the blades and change the angle of attack and regulate the torque around the rotor. But also the thrust is affected by the blade pitch angle. So, uh, and that has consequence to structural loads at the rotor, tower and substructure. And for the case of flow to wind turbines, interaction with the global uh, motions. Uh, we can talk a bit more about, uh, more about, we can talk a bit more about that, 
but uh, first I want to say a bit about controller tuning. Um, controller tuning, we start by linearizing the thrust and the torque uh, around the operational point. And then the design and parameters here are the frequency of the controller and the damping. So basically what we want is to have the frequency and damping in a second order system for the rotor dynamics. And from this, you get to the gains for the controller. And setting a good uh, natural frequency for the controller is important to avoid the interaction with the vibrations in the system. So the natural frequency of the controller determines how quickly the rotor speed will respond to variations in the, um, due, due to disturbance from wind, for example. Uh, so the choice for the controller frequency should be such that it won't interact with the, frequ with the frequencies. So for a bottom fixed turbine, you only have to, to, to bother with uh, structural vibrations, for example, the, the blade uh, flapping edgewise vibrations or the tower vibrations. But for wind, there is also the interaction bit with the floating platform in which the body modes. So this is the classical problem of instability for floating wind turbines. With the turbine, you know, when the turbine pitches downwind, we have that the relative wind speed is increased. This increases the rotor speed. And the controller, you pitch the blades to feather to compensate for the increased uh, torque, but that will decrease thrust and offer even less resistance to motion. And conversely, when the turbine pitches um, upwind, then you have a decrease in the rotor speed, the blades pitch to stall, and the thrust is even bigger, pushing the turbine even further. So this problem is known to cause instabilities for floating turbines. And what people normally do as a remedy is controller detuning. So controller detuning means to adjust the gains such that the frequency of the controller is lower than the platform pitch natural frequency in a way to prevent the controller to respond to pitch motions. Uh, but that of course decreases the controllability to maintain the, wind sp the rated speed under wind disturbance. So this is an example of a bottom fixed DTU 10 megawatt wind turbine with 15 meters per second wind and 14% turbulence intensity. And the blue curve is a non detuned controller, so a controller with a frequency that's uh, optimal for the operation, while the red curve is a detuned controller. And you can see that it's clear how bigger are the variations in the, in the rotor speed. That translates into more variation in thrust and also in power. Uh, for larger flow twin turbines, this may have, uh, they may become even a bigger problem because they tend to have longer NATO periods. So detuning here would be inadequate even at very early design stages. So alternatives to detuning are what you call motion compensation strategies. Here we can keep high controller frequency by providing the controller information about the flow motions of the flow to intermine. So the strategies that I looked into my PhD were in a silly velocity based strategies. One of them is directly feedback of the Nassili velocity to the controller law here by just multiplying the Nassili velocity by a gain. And an indirect strategy, which I call Nassili velocity feed forward, is to actually update the reference rotor speed according to the velocity of the Nassili. And then you end up with a control law like this. In either case, it's important to filter the velocity of the Nassili to avoid feeding wave frequency components to the, to the blades. But that can come with uh, stability because you're going to have a delay in the filtered Nassili velocity. Uh, yes, so one way to check stability is by departing for a coupled platform rotor filter system. Um, by using state, state space representation, you can analyze the eigenvalues. And by checking the real part of, of the eigenvalue with the largest real part, if it is negative, it means that all the other eigenvalues are negatives and the system is stable. So here, um, using for this case, the 20 megawatt spar flow to turbines for one of my publications. And the blue curve is the non-detuned controller and the red curve is the detuned controller. So you see for the detuned controller, all the eigenvalues are negative. So the platform is stable. But here you see that actually the damping uh, coming from the, the aerodynamic effects is quite small. It's just like 3%. Um, 
So when you go to the Nasili velocity feedback method, here uh, in this plot, I actually have the not the velocity, but here the gain that we're using to multiply the velocity. The wind speed here is fixed. But what's interesting to see here is that without using the filter for the Nasili velocity, we see a region of stability here. But when the filter is in the game, then we no longer can ensure stability with this type of approach. And when we use the city velocity feed forward here, uh, we do have very uh, large ranges where, uh, where the gain will provide uh, negative real parts for the gain values and the stability. So the Nasili velocity feed forward is uh, more robust in terms of stability, and even with higher controller frequencies. And we can see here that the damping that the controller imposes is, is really large. So it helps the turbine to, to not become insulated for a long time after it's hit by wave, for example. Uh, yes. So for analysis, we start with environmental modeling. Uh, in this work, I only use linear wave theory for the waves. C states characterized by wave significant height and mean period, and some uh, wave spectrum, which is realized in time domain. Um, for wind, we normally want to consider it as a mean plus a turbulent component. The mean component is varying with the height, with the phenomenon of what we call wind shear. And the turbulent component we assume is stochastic and Gaussian. It's given by the standardization divided by the mean. Um, coherence is about spatial variations of the wind velocity through the rotor or through the wind field. And turbulence models that I, <clears throat> that I used were TurbSim, which is the chimal spectrum with an exponential model for coherence, and the MAN model, which inherits coherence. Okay, coupled analysis takes place when we have subsystems interacting and affecting the global uh, uh, dynamics of the flow to turbine. So here we have their dynamic loads that are imposing motions, and then this will make the controller to, to change its operation, and that will affect the dynamic loads again, subject to mooring, and also the hydrodynamic dynamic loads, everything working together and uh, all of them talking to each other. Uh, one characteristic of flow to turbines is that it, we have a lot of uh, resonant frequency range of interest here, and also a lot of uh, range of excitation. So for the low frequency range, what matters here is turbulent wind, uh, difference frequency second order wave loads, the, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the resistance from the catenary system, and this is affecting the rigid body modes. So first order wave loads, of course, you have the waves, but also the resistance from the tendons in the TLP, and this is also affecting rigid body modes. And for frequencies below or above 0 0.33 hertz, then the most important source of excitation is the blade passing loads and uh, some frequency second order wave loads. And this can excite flexible modes of the structure. Uh, software that I used were SEMA for time domain coupled analysis, uh, including the BM formulation. OpenFast I used mostly for linearization of the wind turbine. And the ROSCO open source controller was used in uh, the last publication. Okay, um, structural integrity assessment. We used to check the ability of the structure to extend the expected loads in a given time span, which for fluid to wind normally is between 20 and 25 years. Uh, and we check for fatigue, extremes, and accidental mainly. There are some standards and guidelines specifically devoted for fluid to wind. And we start the work here with an stochastic description of the environment. So we depart from ocean data. And then a long-term joint distribution of wind and waves, which gives us the distribution that we can use to either weight the fatigue damage or find the extreme uh, contours. So talking a bit about fatigue first, for the wind turbine, uh, it will be not only the wind and waves, but also the blade passing excitation from the rotor. 
uh, here I basically made fatigue based on the actual stresses on tower and platform. And I adopted palm grains miners rule for um, together with bilinear curves for the steel circular welds in marine environment. Uh, Long-term analysis uh, is time consuming and I didn't in any of the, the research that I did really look into an absolute estimate of fatigue, but rather I was more worried about comparing fatigue from different platforms. So what I did was uh, to use the most probable value of uh, yeah, the, the combination of uh, wind and waves that give the most probable value given the joint distribution. Uh, and also I assumed collinear wind and waves because that has been shown before to be in general conservative for floats and wind turbines. Yes, for extremes, it's relevant for material yielding, buckling, and to assess limiting motion amplitudes. And this is inferred from an extreme value distribution. So basically have a number of time domain simulations from a short-term condition. This could be, for example, the time series of actual stresses or motion time series. Then you get the extreme from each of these distributions and fit to a distribution, it can be Gundel. And normally choose a fractile that for this application is somewhere between 50 and 90%. So basically you're going to take the value that is given 50 or 90% of cumulative probability. Uh, selection of load case, I adopt the work from Kim Wan Lee who proposed this modified environmental culture method, which basically takes the, not only the 50 year wind, but also some wind conditions at the operational range of the platform and the associated 50 year wind and uh, wave conditions. So this is equivalent to slicing the contour surface along the operational range. And the objective is to get uh, conditions where we have more trust from the wind turbine, which are not necessarily the most extreme ones. Okay, so then the publications. The first publication was uh, published in Ocean Engineering. The motivation here was to understand these period variations that I mentioned before. So this was observed in model tests done by independent labs. So the first case here, we have same submersible test in different wind speeds. And here you see that the decay periods measured from the tests is varying together with the wind speed. The other work um, is also a sub uh, submersible, and here only one wind speed, but with different controllers. And with different controllers, they got different periods. So I started um, trying to reproduce the phenomenon with simulations. So I used three concepts, uh, I spar and two semis all of them with the same NRL five megawatts wind turbine and same controller. And I reproduced the time domain the simulations over the operational range and got these results for surge and for pitch periods. So for surge, we see that the pattern of the change in period here, yeah. <laughs> it changed a bit in the way that for the OC3 high wind, and for the CSC, the period grows until rated wind speed and starts to decrease. While for those before SMI, it's the opposite. The period decreases and then starts to grow. If you see the mooring arrangement, the OC4 is the only one that has the two lines at the far and the one at the back. So that means that the culprit for the uh, change in period for this, uh, for surge are the nonlinearities in the mooring system. So basically when the turbine is operating, it has uh, different mean thrusts for different mean wind speeds. So it will have different offsets and we will oscillate around offsets uh, where the effective uh, stiffness of the system is, not, uh, is different. So sometimes we like to think that the catenary system is linear for a given range, but what you can see here is that it can make a big difference. But for pitch, the story was a bit different. So basically here we had the same wind turbine, same controller, but the pitch dynamics of each concept was different. So the NATO periods of them were like this, 30 seconds for this uh, OC3, 30, almost 26 for the OC4, and 32 for the CSC. 
And the range of variation in the period was quite different too. So for your C3, it was more or less, I don't know, 8.5 seconds. Here is about five, and here is a more than 10. So something could be related to the interaction between the platform dynamics and the controller. So uh, I made an experiment which consisted in forcing the rotor to oscillate uh, just by imposing harmonic motions to the nacelle under different wind speeds. And I measured the thrust calculated by our dime, which seemed uh, pretty much harmonic, but with a phase with respect to the velocity. So basically, if the velocity is given by this expression, the force you can write as an amplifying factor F0 times the velocity, but with a delay. And if you work it out, you see that the force uh, can be divided into a component proportional to the velocity of the nacelle and another proportional to the acceleration of the nacelle, which means that you have actually a damping effect and an inertia effect. So if you have this in the equation of motion, it's uh, more clear to see how it can affect the dynamics. So in this plot here, we have this uh, amplifying factor as a function of the wind speed and the frequency. While here, we have the phase. Um, since the phase is uh, proportional to the cosines of, uh, since the damping is proportional to the cosines of the phase, so a phase below pi over two would be negative damping. It's a bit chaotic here. Uh, and the phase going towards pi is positive damping. So we see that at rated, we essentially have uh, positive damping, but near rated and for short periods, we can have some uh, regions of negative damping. Yes, uh, I finished the publication quantifying the period changes with a simplified two degrees of freedom model. So linearize the bridge system around the actual displaced position and include the inertia and damping coefficients that are calculated for the ex expressions. And they match more or less well with the time domain simulations. Second paper was an extension of this idea, but this was, um, yeah, it's just a part of investigation. I did this with my colleague, you know, Mario Segaset. Um, and the objective here was first to write expressions for the inertia damping effects and assess the influence of this in the frequency domain analysis. So normally people, uh, when running frequency domain analysis of wind turbines, tend to use a constant damping coefficient uh, Young Marius developed these equations and he got to this closed form expressions for the inertia and damping effects, which are clearly strongly frequency dependent. Uh, here, if we compare the constant damping with the yellow lines for different wind speeds, uh, the blue line is the one calculated with the analytical expression that I showed below uh, before. And the red line is with the method that I showed in the previous paper by oscillating and forcing oscillations with the nacelle. And then we see that in all cases, the constant damping is always larger than what you get if you calculate it, considering the rotor platform uh, couplings, which means that assuming a constant damping calculated based on the derivative of the thrust with the velocity will give us a non-conservative response. We compared this, um, these models with the response in frequency domain with what you get from time domain simulations. And here you can see clearly, so the time domain simulations are the blue curve. Uh, blue curve, yeah. Uh, when we use a frequency domain method with constant damping is here. So we see a predicted smaller response. When we use the calculated frequency dependent damping coefficients, you get an over prediction, but that's at least non conservative. Uh, conservative. Yeah. Okay, um, the third publication is this um, more related to hole flexibility and how to model it and distribute the loads. It was published in the Journal of Offshore Mechanics and Art Engineering. And it basically discuss all the assumptions methods in the modeling of the flex, the, the platform as a flexible structure. So here the pontoons are modeled as flexible beams. 
the hybrid dynamic loads from potential theory are distributed. And I analyze global dynamics and structural response with a model with rigid pontoons. And I also present a method for considering the effect of high elasticity in the global dynamics. So the model was uh, this uh, TLP wind turbine from uh, Erin and Bergeton's uh, paper some years ago. So it basically includes the central column with three pontoons, um, the NRL 5 megawatt wind turbine on the top. So the pontoons are more or less flexible, but the column is kept as a rigid body since it was much stiffer than the, than the pontoons. And diffraction loads and added mass are distributed along the pontoons. But the tower and blades are, are held as flexible. So the analysis includes time domain decays, surge, heave, and pitch, uh, regular waves, irregular waves plus wind for fatigue assessment of the tower base and the tendons, and the comparison with a model with rigid uh, pontoons. So the decay analysis showed that for search, the response compared with the rich model is the same. But for a heave, we see a small increase in the natural period for the flexible mode model. And the first pitch and tower bending frequency of the TLP is also increased. Uh, and you see that for the rich, we could see two modes more clearly, while for the flexible mode, we see a third mode. The analysis for regular waves include also two other flexible models, one with half of the stiffness and one twice the stiffness, the benzene stiffness. And basically, I wanted to measure not only the REOs in heave and pitch, but also the force transfer functions for the tower bending, uh, tower base bending uh, stress and the actual stress at the tendon. So we see that with uh, flexible pontoons, the response is much bigger, but this doesn't seem to affect the force transfer functions at the tower base and at the tendon. Uh, even with the flexible, the, the very flexible pontoon, we don't see a significant difference here in the transfer function. And for fatigue, we do see smaller fatigue for the flexible model and for the uh, both at the tower and the tendon. But the difference is. Uh, are due to loads at higher than wave frequency. So if we see here in the spectrum, the wave frequency region is pretty much the same for the tower bending, tower base bending frequency. So the, what explains this is that because the reflexible model has a different pitch and bending frequency, it has uh, less excitation from blade passing loads. So that just means that modeling the, the tower, the platform as a flexible structure can uh, result in different fatigue prediction due to excitation by rotor uh, blade passing frequencies. So the hydroelasticity study basically consisted in taking two additional modes connect, uh, related to fle deflection of the pontoons. So one mode would be the pontoon at the four and the two others at the F. Uh, then implement this in one based on the mode shape that you get from finite element and get the coefficients from uh, generalized uh, analysis in moment. So I found that the coefficients, they are a few orders of magnitude below the rigid body ones. And as expected, it doesn't really matter for the response of the platform. Okay, so the last publication, this was published in Marvin Structures uh, earlier this year. Here, I made the design of three 20 megawatt spar float wind turbines. Um, what distinguishes them is the different static pitch angle underrated wind. So the platform is modeled as a fully flexible body with potential theory loads distributed over the hood. The controller includes one motion compensation strategy and I perform fatigue and extreme analysis. The objective here is to identify uh, performance and analysis paradigms for 20 megawatt turbines related to distribution of loads, uh, design constraints, structural modeling, control, etc. So the wind turbine that I used here is the one by Ashuri et al. It was from the Shin Wind Energy. Uh, I had to change the tower though because the wind turbine was designed for a bottom fixed uh, turbine. 
the tower is designed for the one turbine. So what I did was to increase a bit the diameter and the thickness of the tower and got to a stiff stiff design here so that I would escape treaty excitation. Uh, then I went to a parametric design approach where I assumed the spar as a cylindrical and hollow structure with constant thickness and I varied uh, the diameter at the base and at the top here, freezing the water. Uh, always keeping the same draft of 90 meters and the tapering angle at 30 degrees. And this distance was six meters for all spars. So it could have a fair comparison in terms of excitation. Uh, I imposed some constraints on periods. So surge more or less 120. Heave always large, longer than 25. And the difference between pitch and heave always bigger than five seconds. And the yaw uh, period was kept at 16. I assumed a catenary system with three lines made with chains. And also I assumed the, uh, a column ballast here with 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So from this, I got some uh, hundreds of solutions. And then the ones that I got as the representative for each group was the one with the lightest steel mass for this static pitch angle limited to six, eight, and 10 degrees. The platforms are then modeled uh, with beam elements with length of approximately five meters per section. Um, I used uh, the methodology of distributed potential theory. So both uh, for starter radiation diffraction loads are distributed over this part. And they are represented in time domain using state space formulation for computational efficiency. Um, second order wave loads were applied using the full QTFs, just different frequency ones, but they are not distributed. They're just applied at the center just to check how are the uh, effect on the global dynamics. The controller is a VSVP1 using a proportional integral controller plus feed forward of the Nasida velocity, which you saw that is more adequate. I use the same controller frequency for the three designs, so I could have the most fair possible comparison. And I also used the peak shaving strategy to limit the thrust near rated wind speed. Okay, so before we see the results for the analysis, uh, it's nice to see how the control performance compares with a detuned controller. So here at the left, we have the poles of the, both the rotor and Nasili systems uh, with motion compensation and with the detuned controller. So we see that with the detuned controller, the, again, the, or the poles mostly associated with the Nasili motion, they're very close to the real uh, axis, to the zero, which means that again, they are almost uh, unstable. And in time domain, this translates into much more damping for the solution with motion compensation than for the D2 in one. So even if the D2 in the controller doesn't have those limit cycle oscillations and instability, it still responds a lot more. It moves for a lot more, it, you know, oscillates in the natural period of the platform. But these motions are damped by the controller with Nasili velocity feed forward. This translates into much better power quality and much less excitation at the tower base for the solution with motion compensation. For the fatigue analysis, the results show that when you have larger pitch restoring, which means smaller pitch angle at rated, you have decreased damage at the platform, but increased at the tower. And that I found to be because, to be because uh, inertia loads associated with wave frequency motions of the platform are more important for the tower. But for the platform, it's the low frequency motions that are governing. Um, here, excluding the QTF or removing from the results didn't really matter in terms of fatigue, either for the platform or for the tower. The difference is smaller than 1% for both cases. Yes, if we model the load distribution with Marzon instead of potential theory, we get a lot more prediction of fatigue damage. And for this platform, at least, this is not caused by bigger excitation at the wave frequency range, but at higher frequency range, no, higher frequency range. 
that's basically because the Morrison's model, it amplifies the low end of the spectrum and end up exciting um, the tower, the first tower mode of the platform, giving more fatigue. So for the extreme analysis, so we have larger uh, theta associated with larger extremes. And extreme, the extremes could be either at associated with the rated wind speed or with the 50 wind speed. So, which means again, it's not the most extreme condition that will give the, the extreme load. Neglecting the QTF resulted in up to 1% difference for the platform, but 4% for the tower. So, it's not so small. Yes, in order to check the relative contribution of inertia, gravity, and thrust forces. So, I made this reconstruction of the um, bending moments at a given point of the tower. So basically what I do here is to get the inertial part, just multiplying the mass over this point by the acceleration of the structural nodes. Um, the gravitational part is doing by multiplying the, the weight of or, or the mass of these parts by the time varying force due to gravity. And the thrust is just the thrust times the distance. And here you see that the, if we compare SPAR 6 and SPAR 10, so two of the, of the designs, we see that the biggest difference is due to gravitational effects. Gravitational effects associated with the weight of the very heavy rotor at the top. Okay. So I think one of the most important conclusions here is that when it comes to the coupled rotor controlling platform dynamics, we can have the trust playing inertia and damping effects, which depend on the wind velocity, but also on the motion frequency. So the detune controller can be stable, but it will not help a lot in damping the motions. And it still can provide negative damping surge. So that can be important for more in design. Using a constant damping in a frequency domain model is a non-conservative approach. And the Murray's frequency surge is significantly affected by typical offsets caused by the trust. Um, when it comes to platform flexibility, we see no negligible consequence to the tower bending frequency. And it's recommended to use potation, distributed potential theory instead of using Morrison. For the controller, the detune controller is now inadequate for the next class of all twin turbines. It has been very uh, widely used in academic research until now but that can be very deceptive. And at the same time, the Nassili Velocity PD4 is a very effective and relatively simple strategy to be included in the models. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Yes, we are here. Okay, uh, thanks again. Uh, so we will have 10 minutes break. And as I mentioned, uh, if from the audience, anyone has a question or those online, just please let me know. So should be coffee and biscuit outside. Those who are online, uh, uh, you take the coffee, we will eat biscuit instead <laughs> of you. <laughs> See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>